thanks everyone for joining. It's really great to have you here again. Uh, this is uh, our latest edition of the webinar, which we're doing this time specifically on teaching strategic management through the use of business simulations. Um, we're looking forward to get, getting into the conversation and I'm delighted to have uh, Dr. Peter Barton here from uh, Liverpool John Moores, a lecturer in strategic management. Hi, Peter, how are you doing? Good morning, uh, Leon. Good morning, uh, everybody. Um, yes, I think you, you've covered my introduction. Um, so yeah, Dr. Peter Barton from uh, Liverpool Business School. And uh, yeah, look forward to sharing my experiences with you today about teaching strategic management through uh, business simulation. Absolutely. And you've been using the, the simulation, I know, for uh, uh, some, well, some years now at uh, Liverpool John Moores. So, so quite some experience. And uh, I think, you know, a lot of the attendees here are going to be, you know, really interested to hear about your experience. So yeah, really looking forward to getting into the conversation. Yeah, me too. Excellent. Good. Good. All right. Well, I think there's still some people uh, coming in, but uh, well, well, we'll crack on. So, uh, well, thanks again, everyone, for joining. As you know, we, we try to host these webinars quite regularly because uh, we think it adds a lot of value to the, to the academic community of the, in the business schools, um, specifically on sort of sharing use of uh, business simulations and promoting experiential learning, which is what we're all about. By the way, I'm Leon Lloyd. I'm the Business Development Manager with Edumundo. And what we typically do uh, for the format for these things is we will, uh, I'll spend sort of five or 10 minutes just giving a bit of background to our approach with simulations uh, and how we work as a company. And then, well, we'll hand things over to our guest speaker. And uh, uh, interestingly, actually, I know, uh, Peter, that you uh you, you, you actually presented at a learning and teaching conference some, uh, some months ago, uh, perhaps middle of last year, um, specifically on this subject. So I think that was because we, we, we were talking about that. That was sort of partly the reason why I thought it would be great to actually have you present a lot of this stuff actually on our webinar as well. So, yeah, that's, that's that right, a, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. We had a, an internal teaching and learning conference um, yeah, last academic year. And uh, yeah, absolutely delighted to, uh, to, to share some of the, um, yeah, the, the, the findings and, and uh, thinking there. So, yeah. Great. All right. Well, um, just to sort of say a bit of uh, like, yeah, sort of general housekeeping sort of stuff. Uh, we are recording the session. Um, we like to send everyone who's attended a copy of the recording afterwards. And of course, for everyone who's missed it, too. Um, please feel free to say hello on the chat. And uh, it's always nice if you want to put where you're calling in from, uh, which part of the country or if you're calling in from a, a different time zone. It's nice to know where everyone's at. Um, but we'll typically, uh, yeah, we'll typically try to deal with your, your questions as we go uh, on the chat. But of course, we've also tried to keep a bit of time back towards the end for a dedicated sort of Q&A as well. So feel free to drop your questions in the chat as we go or hold them back for later on. And we'll, we'll try to address them uh, in the sort of 10 uh, minutes or so. Um, if we do have time towards the end as well, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But perhaps we'll also show you a, a very brief overview of uh, the, the simulation which Peter's using as well in his teaching. Okay, great. Well, just to give a bit of background, uh, so we're Edumundo. Uh, we've been operating since 2001, actually, developing management simulations. Uh, since then, we've, we've actually broadened out into other subjects too, but simulations is still the core focus of what we're doing, focused on, on supporting business schools. We have around 40 employees, most of whom based uh, in our head office in The Hague, but also uh, in other parts of the world too, uh, for example, in the UK, where I'm based. Uh, and we work with a huge number of universities worldwide. Uh, so we're active in all continents of the world. And we also support the private sector too. So we, we, we work with a number of uh, private companies with their uh, leadership development programs, for example. And that experience is also quite useful because we can feed that back into our product development process too. As you can imagine, it's quite a large number of students that we're working with. Uh, each year. So just a few quick points on how it works uh, from our perspective. So our management simulations, which we have quite a large portfolio of, they're all web based. So they all work on the browser, as you'd expect. So no software to install um, and they work on any device. So if students want to, they can access, for example, on their smartphones, although there's quite a bit of information to consume. So it's always best to have a big screen where possible. But we'll put students into teams. Uh, so they're, they're, they're in teams of four or five, for example, although that's flexible, uh, and they're taking over an existing company. So straight away, the, the teams have to start 
uh, developing their analytical skills by undertaking a range of internal and external uh, market analysis. Once they've got a bit of a sense of what's going on within their own company and uh, in the external environment, they'll then start to formulate a business plan and then take a range of decisions across a number of rounds where one round equates to one year of operations. And that's highly flexible how we set that up. It's often mapped across a semester where one round is played each week of study, but it can all be, it, it can be much more intensive. For example, uh, for, for some customers, we'll deliver that in one day, for example, as a very intensive gameplay day. Uh, the time investment is very flex flexible as well, depending on how we set it up. Uh, but the important thing is that our simulations are highly competitive. So the dynamic, the dynamic uh, nature of the algorithm means that uh, students are playing against the other student teams on the same course. So that makes it more fun, more engaging, and that's really what's sort of driving the engagement, really. Uh, so we cater for all student levels. We have a range of different simulations, uh, some more complex than others, and all of them a little bit tailorable to make them more or less complex, depending on the level as well. So typically, in terms of simulations generally, well, we find that the reasons for actually deploying a simulation within a program or module is that it's really to sort of drive that engagement, to get students really engaged in their learning. Um, and that, of course, leads to um, improved satisfaction. So students are often on there, and, and Peter will go on to talk a little bit about this, I think, on one of his slides. But uh, so students typically feeding back that they, uh, they, they find it a very rewarding experience, a good opportunity to apply their theoretical knowledge uh, in a safe environment, of course. Um, this can lead to other sort of high level benefits as well. So continuation is, is of course, really important in HE today. Uh, so, yeah, students sort of continuing beyond their first six months of study, uh, but also progressing into graduate employment. So strongly linking this to the employability skills, which is a big part, of course, of students working in teams, developing their uh, critical thinking, their analysis, their leadership skills and all these sorts of things. And what we're increasingly finding is actually that from a sort of strategic perspective uh, within the business schools, often business schools now are starting to use this to sort of close the loop really. So not only improving engagement, uh, but also, so yeah, satisfaction, but then building this back into the marketing proposition and the offer for students in order to, uh, to feed the recruitment process. So last slide from me before I stop sharing, just to say that we have a wide portfolio of simulations and we cover most uh, subjects within the business school. So uh, I've put some screenshots there of some of the examples and uh, some bullet points on the side here, some of the different courses that we'll support. Um, so if anyone's interested after this uh, webinar, if you'd like to get in touch, uh, we're happy to have a sort of one-to-one -one consultation to work out uh, which simulation will best fit with your module, or even if you're coming at it from a program perspective, we're happy to perhaps help advise on which module might be the best choice to uh, have a, a simulation sit on that as well. Okay, all right. Well, I'll stop sharing. And uh, yeah, well, Peter, absolutely delighted to have you here again. And uh, I know you've got some slides you'd like to show too. So I perhaps... have indeed. Let me see if I can get those going. Um, so you should see the white screen of mine at the moment. We can indeed, yeah. Although we can see the, um, uh, we can't see your full screen. So we can see the the the, the sort of, um, can you see, a, yeah, we, you see the full screen now? Hang on, let me just try it again. Sorry. Um, that's right. Yeah. I know, yeah. Cause if you're using multiple, you do multiple, uh, monitors. Yeah. So yeah. Hang on, here we go. Let me do that one more time. Okay. So no share screen. Yeah. Okay. I will share that one with you and then I will, um, swap my screen over and that's right. Right. Brilliant. Can that's you now perfect. see, uh, Simulation stimulation, is that all yeah, visible to absolutely. you? absolutely, that's it. And I'll, I'll try and, um, yeah, I'll try and keep keep quiet a little bit, actually, uh, Peter. So it's quite nice that it takes the pressure off me a little bit, but perhaps I'll just interject uh, a few times as well as, as you're going along. Excellent. Well, thanks very much, Dean. And a big welcome to all of you. It's nice to see you, uh, so I see you online. I've, I've got very used to um, teaching back in the classroom, and that was absolutely excellent to get in uh, back in after lockdown. And actually now it's quite secretly nice to get back uh, in, in a nice uh, online environment as well. I think I quite enjoy the, the, the hybrid world. Um, but anyway, yeah, big welcome. My name is Dr. Peter Barton, and I'm a senior lecturer at the Liverpool Business School at Liverpool John Moores. 
um, teach the level six uh, student strategic management, which is a um, core module. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about um, using simulations as a way of encouraging student engagement. Um, as a little bit of background, now I began my teaching career um, freshly from the business world in 2017. Um, I formerly worked as a management consultant at Accenture. Um, I ran a group of opticians in the Northwest and then sold that and then thought, oh, bit of a career change. I had my PhD and thought I'll go into uh, teaching at university. Now, I have to confess, I had slightly unrealistic expectations to begin with around students' willingness to read and engage um, in related seminar activities. So uh, as much as I really like case studies and I've written case studies myself, I think I was um, thinking back to my time, uh, my excellent experience at, uh, at UMIST in, in Manchester. Um, we had a lot of sort of um, case studies, a lot of things we worked through in the seminars together. But I was very surprised when I'd come into teaching um, that, that students' willingness to, to read was, was not as I was hoping or, or expected. So I quickly realized I needed to do something to improve those seminars as, as times have perhaps changed. Um, during my first year teaching at LJMU, we had to do a PG cert, so I haven't had a teaching background uh, other than scuba diving, so it's something slightly different. Um, and part of that PG cert was um, we had to do a study, we had to do a poster, actually, a study and a poster, um, which actually is a separate point. It's quite an interesting and fun uh, assignment in itself, something that a colleague of mine uses to great effect. Um, and the poster you can see there, you shouldn't be able to read it all. Um, but you can see the sort of work that I, I put into that. And uh, I conducted a number of focus groups investigating group work and uh, also around simulations to try and, um, you know, identify the problem I had in terms of engagement, looking for solutions, what kind of innovations we could bring in, like simulations, um, how we could apply that, and then looked at the evaluation of that. Um, so I suppose this work kind of, um, it stemmed from that because I wanted to change that first year of teaching experience into something that was going to be a bit more dynamic and engaging for the students. Um, and now, you know, business simulations often kind of purported to close that application gap by exposing students to, in this context, sort of real business uh, situations so they can try and enhance their skills. They can try and apply the theory that they've learned um, in a very, very safe environment. Um, crucially, it shifts that learning from very passive techniques. You know, we're all sitting here, you know, probably if you with a coffee, relaxed in a sort of listening mode, um, but also passive techniques like reading um, and, and listening to a much more active um, and participative um, approach using group activities um, and discussions. So you're actually doing the real thing. So that's very well reflected in the literature. And I put up here just one element of um, it's Dale's theory of learning, the cone of learning from 1969. Um, as a side point, I did quite like getting back into strategic management when I realized that actually most of the models and theories hadn't changed that much since when I was at university. So that wasn't a particularly fast um, uh, uh, relearning that I had to do. But of course, the context had changed quite dramatically. Um, but anyway, the cone of learning you can see here that you might be familiar with, and I'm not going to go into great detail, but it shows you that that more active uh, doing rather than reading, hearing and watching um, is more effective for retention. Um, and that active approach really links well for those higher learning outcomes. So for me, teaching level six of undergraduate my final year, the emphasis is much more on those higher level thinking elements. So I try and tell my students, you know, focus on analysis, focus on synthesis, evaluation. Yes, description and examples are, are important, but really try and think about those higher level thinking aspects in order to get the higher grades. Um, another model that I won't go into, but you're probably more familiar with is perhaps Bloom's Taxonomy of Learning um, from 1956, which really emphasizes that creating work has the highest impact to learning. Um, so what else does the research say before I move on to my um, experiences and some best practices that I've found? Um, now, higher education is, is often criticized for relying heavily on that theory, lacking application to the real world. And I think in a business context, we've seen globalization that has changed um, human capital requirements in the corporate sector. 
um, and therefore those employability skills um, are changing all of the time. So whilst that theoretical understanding is still highly valued, of course, most important, um, but students increasingly require things like you know, communication skills, creative thinking, critical analysis, um, innovation, um, as well as those kind of decision-making skills where they're not just receiving information and regurgitating, they're actually really trying to make decisions, apply and justify those decisions. And that requires a really multidisciplinary approach. Um, so I'm just going to go through a few very quickly uh, theoretical sort of impact benefits and outcomes from simulation from the research that I did when I did my PG cert. So one thing is around motivation. Um, that real experience leads to so much more enjoyment. And I think we all needed a lot more enjoyment when it was in uh, lockdown mode, at least here in the UK. Um, deeper learning, definitely, and through that practical experience. So the motivation for the students, I felt, was a really important aspect. Like I said, my first year of teaching, you know, I think was, was probably not excellent, partly because I just couldn't really galvanise the students to appear motivated. Um, and I feel that has changed a lot now. Um, students obviously are trying to problem solve, and that really encourages that critical and analytical thinking. Um, in turn, that leads to more understanding um, and greater skill development as a team too. Um, the transfer of knowledge is, is definitely something that I really enjoyed. You know, in the, we, the way we work is we have a lecture, I'm sure many of you are saying, a one hour sort of lecture, maybe two hours, and then you'll have a seminar or workshop, or perhaps if you might call it a tutorial, where you're trying to engage the students um, and get them to do the work. And allowing them to uh, work with something like a simulation, you're able to coach on the side with that theoretical and conceptual um, linkage, if you like, to the lectures as well. So it really helps with a, a transfer of knowledge. Um, Decision-making and cross-functional skills. There's a lot of different business functions um, that students um, that are doing a business degree obviously are covering. And strategic management is kind of the helicopter view where you're looking over at the big picture at everything. And if um, Leon does show the simulation, you'll see that you still have to do all those operational, marketing, finance, uh, HR type um, uh, functional skills each week. But actually, it's the strategic perspective that's the glue that kind of binds it all um, together. Um, the retention of knowledge. We actually had a session a couple of weeks ago for our placement students at Liverpool, John Moores. Um, absolutely excellent se um, se session that was delivered by a colleague. Um, all about storytelling as a way of standing out in employment. Uh, but it made me think that a lot of good teaching, when I think back to some of my best teachers, it, it is around storytelling, obviously relevant and contextual and linking into theories. But we remember things as humans via stories and the experiences that people have through things like simulations really helps with that retention. Um, and there's that storytelling that comes from um, that, 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 you know, that working together with others and they can then re remember what happens different weeks because there's elements that really stand out and that's something in the literature that, that really shines through as well. Um, you've got to be adaptable. I think um, uh, the, the learning is definitely accelerated when students have to think. They've got complex situations um, and you as the lecturer can sit on the side trying to coach um, and really try and uh, encourage students to be more entrepreneurial. Um, it's very safe using a simulation because you know you can make mistakes and it just doesn't really matter other than the competitive element. Um, and so students can learn from those mistakes in a very safe way. And then finally around the, uh, the literature, um, I looked into a lot around behavioral, uh, attitudinal and knowledge exchange and it was really found that um, students' attitudes really improve as they share their experiences and observations with others. I mean, I'm sure you all find that in a seminar kind of environment, the best ones are where students are all talking to each other and actually you're not necessarily having to lead them the whole time. It's not, a, it's not like a lecture where you're just delivering information and they're listening. They're actually communicating and discussing with each other. So, that was kind of the, the background and justification for me to move into a simulation-led uh, um, seminar environment. Peter, um, actually just, um, can I just, yeah, uh, yeah I was just going to say, if, if you come back, and just, uh, just to yeah, yeah, of course. Back yeah, 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 I, I was just, I was just going to sort of pick out a couple of things there because, of course, 
the, the part about increased retention of knowledge, I suppose that links quite strongly to your previous slide about the um, the cone of learning again, Ed, Edgar Dale. But I think that, that is really important because you know, as we know that like if you're if you're if you're having fun and you're enjoying what you're doing, then you're more likely to retain it. But it's also it's it's really separating that link between the sort of the dry theory part. And I often I often sort of talk about this sort of context and relevance piece, which which seems to be missing in HE, I think, as you've you've highlighted as well. If if students can't find something to directly relate that theory to, then that's the missing link a little bit. So, stu so students will remember more about the theory where they've got an opportunity to apply it directly, right? Absolutely. I mean, that, that is very true. And a, a lot of the feedback is I'll, I'll sort of come to it. it I think students often pick up on that. They go, I can actually see the, the relevance of that theory. It, it's not just sort of, sort of abstract concept because uh, strategic management, uh, you know, it, it often is quite abstract. Um, and the way we contextualize it is through examples. But, you know, people, a lot of people don't read the papers um, and you get some news through info, um, social media, et cetera. But I, I think actually doing um, gives a lot, a lot better retention of knowledge than just, just kind of, you know, reading about it and trying to think of examples that help to um, represent a particular model or theory. Um, yeah, so absolutely. absolutely. I think that's a great point. Yeah, and you know, we often we often uh, work with with uh, I mean, you know, case studies are also quite popular in, in business schools, of course, and um, I think case studies go a little bit towards achieving that, but it's yes. still sort of a little bit separate from doing it yourself, isn't it? Absolutely, I love case studies, and, and like I said, I've got written quite a few a few case studies that I really enjoy, and I still still will go through them. Um, but they have to engage, and what I found the problem was that I found students would turn up at a at a seminar and they hadn't read it. And you had no choice but to either say tough or we're going to spend the first 20 minutes reading it and you kind of lost them and then the attendance falls as well. Um, so, you know, you, you've got to make sure you strike that balance, I, I find. Yeah, um, yeah. And but I've come to balance last... as well. Yeah, go on. Yeah, no, I was just going to say on that last point there about the um, the behavioural uh, aspects. You know, I, we, actually, we actually had another speaker uh, a few months ago, uh, Charles Bladen from Anglia Ruskin, and uh, he was talking a lot about uh, the self-directed learning, you know, and so this idea of trying to, yeah, place a bit more responsibility on the students to find out the answers for themselves, albeit that there isn't necessarily a right or wrong answer, but it's 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 encouraging that mindset of students to work with their peers uh, and, and and less reliance on expecting the the lecturer to to give them the right answers, right? So I just maybe look at a little bit of that. Absolutely. And I think that's very true with this simulation, with the, uh, the sneakers trainers uh, simulation that, you know, there isn't a right answer because it, it, it's not perfect in terms of comparison with the real world. But it does represent the real world in many aspects, um, including that if you were to do exactly the same decisions from one year to the next, you wouldn't have the same outcomes because you're impacted by what other groups are doing. And, and so, you know, there might be good approaches and good decisions that don't always get the, the results that you want. And that's part of business is, is to try and, and see what's working, what's not working. And, and that will be different in every environment and every context. So I think that that's a, you know, that learning is important. And that does come through thinking for yourself rather than because they ask the lecturer, they say to me or the seminar leader, or oh, what should I do here? And you can give them some help and advice, but ultimately you don't know what's going to be the perfect uh, solution. You have a good idea what you think will work, but you don't really know because it depends on what other people are doing and what other other um, competitors are doing. So, you know, that aspect I think is is not only fun, but it is also um, brings in both the group and the individual work too together. So that's good. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Excellent. All right. Well, you'd be pleased to know that's kind of my theory-ish uh, bit done, and, and I'll move on to sort of my practical experiences. And this, um, I, be, I think there's a few people probably on here that have, have used simulations, and I'd be interested. It's always nice to share what works. Now, what are those actual things that are, are not necessarily best practices, but, but things that have been very beneficial? And the four years that I've um, been uh, using the Edgy Mandel sim simulation, I've got a few things that I'd share if you were thinking about going down this route. Um, I've got quite large cohorts now. Um, some people say, oh, simulation with too many will be a problem. I think the opposite. Um, I find it has given a really good structure in managing large cohorts. 
Um, I had 200, well, depends what you call large. But many of you might have six, 700, but you know, I had 210 last year. Um, next year is going to be around 300, uh, maybe 350, possibly going on up to 400 the year after. And I found that the structure the simulation gives is, is excellent um, because it provides structure to the seminars, a real purpose. Um, and also, if you've got uh, additional seminar leaders or tutorial helpers, um, I, I, even if they haven't used the simulation before, it gives them some consistency and structure um, to, to manage that. And uh, I think that has been a very, very useful way of getting consistency through the module as well. Um, so I've been very, very pleased with, with, with that aspect. So you've got large groups, don't be put off um, by the idea of having simulation as, as sort of the, the core part of the practical side of your module. Um, I think probably the biggest thing is it's that common purpose, that collective responsibility that comes from simulations. Um, I mean, they, most of the students love it. It's not everyone, but most absolutely love it. And I'm sort of passionate on this point. Um, I actually find it a pleasure to teach a lot of the time, especially when you're repeating a seminar. At the moment, I'm doing a wonderful seminar, I'm really enjoying, but I'm repeating the same thing over and over again, and it gets quite exhausting. Whereas, especially the first sort of four or five weeks, it, it's, it's actually quite social and you can wander around and really get to know the students. I think, um, you know, students, names are so important to all of us. Names are what identify us, and I'm not great with them, but I want to be great. But you get to know your students really quickly because you got the list of who's in your group and you can go oh look we've got we've got Mary we've got Mohammed here we've got Peter but then you know we're missing John hasn't turned up you know where's he and you just start to pick up names and faces and get that rapport very very quickly but anyway back to my point about that common purpose and I had to add in here and I know we're hopefully not at going back into a lockdown situation but I felt I was one of the only people that I knew that it actually enjoyed breakout rooms um, they worked out really well in Zoom and uh, I think most students, I was stunned to begin with in other uh, modules and induction, I, I, they would just have their, their cameras off, they'd have their mics off, they didn't want to speak. And, and it was just like a nightmare being thrown into a group together. But if you let people work with their friends and they know people, hard to do at level four, but in the final year, when people know uh, others, they can work with people they want to work with. It's a little bit of social side, but then obviously they'll get together and go, what have we got to do here? And they have a bit of banter, they have fun, but they're also working very, very hard at the same time. So that to me has been probably the best aspect, um, both in classroom and online. Um, that's worked very, very well. And I think, I think Peter, as well, yeah. over COVID as well, when everything was online, you know, in a way that group work opportunity for students was more important than ever because, you know, students were increasingly isolated. And so that opportunity to have a sort of structured part of their week where you know that's part of the learning process that they, they know they'll be working in their teams just really great for I, th I think everyone who's just otherwise stuck on their own in their own uh homes right absolutely and and i think if you're thrown out into random breakout rooms that does the the has the opposite effect perhaps on your sort of your mental health and well-being unless you're very gregarious and, and outgoing and are willing to you know whip up a, a a room and and really you know create excitement but students the vast majority they'll be confident but within a safe boundary and I think the structure that you get from that common goal of working in a team together it automatically makes uh, students engaged and communicate well uh, together and I was very happy for students to have the first 10-15 minutes chatting about other things you know you go into a breakout room and they're talking about football and actually I was quite happy with that because I knew the group was working well and they'd be working outside of those seminar rooms but it was a really important time for them to to you know share experiences you know the office in all of our offices we have other chat that's not all about work i confess i do um and i think you know that that's an important part for students as well uh good okay um the interactive nature has really helped student attendance actually i mean i said engagement fun and, and, and ambition but actually the attendance rate has been very good I think in my first year, it tailed off very, very quickly, um, the, the sort of the, the percentage of attendance. And actually, I've been really impressed that it's generally around 90% um, attendance plus, and it stays on right to the end. Um, and even my other seminar leaders found the same. So that has been a very, very important part um, for us. That's, that's, really, that's really positive. And actually, you know, as we know, although attendance is it doesn't doesn't equal engagement it's it's a good start isn't it you know in, in order to get a good engagement then often attendance is, is the best place to start with that 
Absolutely. Well, if you're not there, you, you, you can't uh, you can't engage, can you? So absolutely. And, and Peter, what, what do you mean about, uh, you know, ambition here? Simulating? Are you talking about ambition to to do well within their studies? Uh, yes, else? the studies. I, well, I, I actually really meant it, though, more in the context of the simulation. I think, um, okay. you know, competition is so important. Um, now, I, you know, I enjoy my sport and I like to win. I like to think I'm not too competitive, but it's it's fun when you've got a goal. And I think the simulation um, makes students quite ambitious to, to do well. And, and also, I said before about that collective responsibility, actually, if they don't turn up, or if they don't contribute, then most will feel that they're letting others down a little bit, which is a good thing. They're trying to, um, you know, actually put their best foot forward for each other because it's not just them, you know, they actually have a responsibility. Now, that's not going to be every student, of course. And there are some that absolutely piggyback on, on the, the, the abilities and hard work of others. Um, that's inevitable. But I would say 80 to 95 percent of students, they really want to do well for their colleagues um, as much as themselves. So I think well, that's an important point. Um, good. I think um, that I've already said about sort of safe environment. Uh, that is, is a really important aspect around the, the, the sort of practical work. Um, you know, students are able to make those decisions and they can compartmentalize. They might say, look, you know, so and so in the team is more on marketing. I'm on finance and you can separate your, your roles, if you like, and then come together collectively for part of the session. Um, but they can make mistakes. Um, they can be more entrepreneurial and they're not going to actually lose any money. Um, it just doesn't matter at the end of the day, even though they're being competitive and they'd like to win. Um, so I think that that safe environment is, is, is absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, you can learn together and if it goes wrong, you learn from those mistakes, probably more than those that everything just happened to go well because they made a very, very good decision at the beginning. Um, so I always try and say to that to the students and the groups that haven't performed as well earlier on is, look, it's not too late. You're probably not going to win it from here, but your objective is to turn it around from this position and, um, you know, get the best out of, out of it. And, and they often do, uh, but most of the time they do. Um, the linking from theory to practice. I mean, I said that we had the lecture and then we have the, um, the, the, the seminar. I find that absolutely superb. And the, um, the, the fact that it changes from the first few weeks of the semester through to the last few weeks is, is important to recognize that early on we focused very much around the simulation in the seminar. So maybe 90% might be getting to grips with it, working in teams, and you can coach from the sidelines, um, uh, you know, bringing in theory from the lecture um, and try and contextualize that. But by the end, a lot less of the lecture, so the seminar will be taken up with the simulation as they become good at it. And you can move on to other tasks, other aspects, maybe case studies or whatever else you include, but particularly more of a focus upon things related to the assignment, which is what the students want. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think that link I've definitely found as, as very important in practice. Um, assignments feed in very, very well. I'll come to that a bit more actually in the next slide, but that's a very, very important aspect. And then finally, module feedback. Again, I've got a slide that will probably help on that, but I, I found that the module feedback, there's been big improvements and I'll, I'll mention that again in a second. Um, but the, that, that's what we found um, in practice for in, in the business school. Um, it's worth sort of noting that uh, obviously that this will involve finance for, for your business school. It's gonna require time and effort for you guys um, if you, you're gonna go down this route. And if you did manage it badly, individual students will have a negative experience. Um, you know, care's got to be made to, to ensure that the learning outcomes that you're looking for are well linked. Um, you've got to make sure everything's user friendly um, and kind of unambiguous, particularly when you're linking to assessments. Um, that overall objective is to align the learning outcomes, um, you know, to that sort of richer level of learning. Um, so some of the sort of experiences I've had to make sure you overcome that. And actually, it's worth just saying quickly, I was worried at the beginning that this would take a lot of my time. Um, it took a little bit of time. Heist at the time and uh, Leon, I think, and Callum have been involved since. Will you know introduce someone who's looking into this and and start to to show you how it all works. But actually, the amount of time I did in terms of uh, the assignment design and, and getting to grips with things 
was easily outweighed by the sort of time savings the semester developed. So I, I found it was actually quite time efficient and, and each year it is for me now. Um, I found that it works best with around, uh, each. Well, I should probably say each market, uh, each group was a seminar for us. So we had, you know, maybe if you've got eight seminars, you've got eight different markets, which you can call whatever you like. And we have about 20 to 30 typically, but actually it works quite well up to 40. Um, in that, each team, each group will probably be about two, three, four, five, six, maybe in a group. I'd recommend probably three to five. I allowed six this year and I thought that was far too many. That actually became a bit of a problem. Um, but about three to five works. So you have about six to 10 in a market. If you have less than, say, four in a market, that's not going to work quite as well, maybe three or four. Um, I imagine more than 10 gets a little bit unwieldy. But of course, you can have lots and lots of different markets. So you can have competitions in markets and you can have an overall score competition as well. Um, the support is required early on. Like I said, there's a much higher focus in those first two or three weeks, maybe 80, 90 percent might be around the simulation. And then by the end, there's not actually that much later on. The module leader will need help in that first year. Um, and uh, it, what, what I think Edumundo have done really well for us, um, I know Heist said this to begin with, and Leon, you've, you, you've been very good, and making it clear that the module leader or the seminar leader is the expert in strategic management. We are not the experts in the simulation. Now, I like to consider myself, I'm becoming an expert in this simulation, um, the simulation, the sneakers one, um, because I know it quite well. But I was not worried at all having new seminar leaders about their use of the simulation, because one of the things Leon said very, very clearly this year, and I say this to the seminar leaders, is you, know, you are the experts on strategic management. Any problems with the simulation, try and help, try and guide, but hold your hand up and say, I'm not sure about that in the simulation. You just contact the help desk, it's at the top right, and they'll get back to you always within 24 hours, but typically much, much faster than that in a, in a few hours, unless you've changed the sort of the terms, Leon, but pretty quickly. And actually that allows you to not wash your hands, but sort of go, you know, don't worry, I'm, I'm not looking silly here. This, this isn't what I'm an expert in. I'm new to this and, uh, you know, we're all learning together. So actually that first year was no harder in many ways than, than teaching it now, having been quite used to using it. Um, but you, you know, you do need to make sure that you kind of get, get that support. Yeah, no, and then um, just to add to yeah, that, I think, oh. uh, Peter, I think I, I, I reckon you're, you are becoming an expert in the simulation now. I think it's fair to say you've been using it for quite, quite some time and, uh, you, you, you know, you seem really confident using it. But even so, uh, absolutely, we'll still come and give you that support that you need on, the, on day one when, when students are about to start and come back and do that sort of live Q&A session. Um, absolutely. And this sort of thing as well. But no, we haven't changed the, the help desk still works in the same way. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, no, that's good. That works really, really well. Um, as I said, it kind of worked well for remote learning. It, it does. The break, you have to put a lot of work into the breakout room and setting them up manually, but that works really well. We were allowed actually to have larger seminar groups online. Um, and I didn't do that. I did the opposite. I actually expanded the number because one of the reasons I felt I had quite nice feedback online was because I was able to have all these smaller groups I could get around them and go around every breakout room exactly like I would if it was a normal seminar room and you get to see every single person every week. I think if you have too many, um, then actually for remote learning, you don't get to see them. They don't get that rapport and engagement and uh, opportunity to ask questions as well. Uh, so that, that was an important point. We use Canvas at uh, LGMU. I think Blackboard and other systems are, are used. Um, I found allowing students to self-select their groups very, very important, um, help to encourage that congruent teamwork. Um, and also, if you can, it can cut down on the admin because there's a bit of, it's quite front-loaded, the work you have to do as a module leader, organising everybody into teams and groups. It may be uh, practical, but it, it is uh, something to consider. Uh, almost there, a couple more points. Um, assessment is really important to consider. Um, I think I was the same as a student, um, but I, I, I'm always surprised just how important every bit of information has to relate to the assignment in the student's mind. You would never begin a lecture by saying, this isn't in the exam or this isn't in the assignment unless um, you, know, you were really interesting and going to bring up a point that everyone wanted to, to understand. Um, and actually making sure that the simulation is somehow linked is important. 
I, I use a group presentation um, that allows people to work in group work, but I'm personally quite conscious that I don't want to have too many, um, too much of the uh, weighting of assignments towards group um, work. So I have a reflective individual piece as well, a report, and they can reflect back um, uh, upon that. And that seems to work very well for me. Another colleague who adopted my most of sort of my uh, course and materials, um, they actually changed the presentation and had a, a more of a blog approach. But I think having sort of some group work and some individual work is important. And I don't get many issues with people complaining about contribution in groups. There's the odd one, but it's much, much less than I would have ever expected. Um, I've also said in that that actually a really good side point that I'm realizing is I think that the simulation assignment really helps to cut down on probable, I, I'm not sure, but external essay writing companies. We're told that students go online and they buy their essays now. Now, I actually haven't you know, caught anybody. And if there's someone I'm slightly suspicious about, I've probably not gone and done a big investigation. But what I can say is that where there are ones that have been written, and I think, oh, that could have been written by someone else, they will naturally perform very badly in the assignment because they have not lived and breathed every week that a student who has participated and engaged in, in that simulation. So they will do very badly if they pay someone else to do their work for it. Because yes, they have to talk about theory, but they have to apply it to their business. And that to me has been absolutely brilliant for fairness um, across the student cohort as well. Um, so I yeah. didn't underestimate that. That's, that's really good points. And um, just, just to interject uh, for, for a minute, just to sort of say, I've noticed there's quite a few questions actually coming through on the chat. So I haven't, I'm not ignoring those, but I'll come to those in a second. But perhaps before we do, Peter, because I think that the assessment piece is so important here. Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, and I completely share your views that, you know, if you say to students from the outset, you know, you can do this if you want, but you don't have to. Well, typically the students won't do it because, you know, they need to they need to find that link between how it's going to benefit them for their overall study and their credit. Um, so that's really important. So I guess I'm curious, did you did you have to revalidate your module um, when you started this or did you take the existing assessment um, approach and then apply that using the simulation? I think it coincided um, with us uh, having a bit of a redesign of the program. So it, it fortunately worked very well there for us. So there okay. wasn't too much of a redesign. The main thing was to make sure those learning outcomes were still going to be covered. So when I was designing the assignment to, to just check each uh, out outcome was going to be well ticked uh, through the assignment that was linked to the simulation. OK, OK. Did you did you have one more point on this slide before I address these questions? One more or? point and then I'm almost done. And then it's pretty much I've got one more very, very small, um, very small slide. But that's more about feedback. Um, there was the practicalities around IT suites. Don't underestimate that as an importance. Now, your university might have lots of IT suites and all your students might have laptops. Um, but there is that practicality that you think about, because although you can use your mobile phone, I don't think you'd want to do the simulation on a mobile or even probably a uh, tablet. Um, so it is important. You don't have to have one for every student, of course. You need one for every group. Um, and I've put remote connectivity, but that's probably more for online. And God, pray, let's hope that we're not doing that again. So, <laughs> no, the, the, yeah, the, these are these are important sort of physical considerations, are they? And how I often sort of think of it in terms of the phones piece is that if you've got one person in your team who is actually being the sort of scribe, if you like, and inputting the decisions on a laptop, then you can still have perhaps the other members of the teams maybe joining on their phones as well, just so that they can see a little bit about what's going on. Um, Absolutely. Perhaps when social distancing isn't so much of an issue, of course, you can have everyone <laughs> huddled around a laptop and that's fine, but... Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, okay. I'm, not, I'm, I'm all, almost there really now, because I'm conscious here yeah, time sort of sort of pressing on, and there are quite a few questions, but just okay. to sort of finish off, uh, you know, I, I've really found it's helped um, me, uh, but I've also passed this on, like you say, through the Turkish Teaching and Learning Conference, and I've helped other strategic management lecturers with this. Um, and the satisfaction ratings from individual module evaluations have really improved. Um, I think uh, modules that had Edumundo, had 90% plus on our internal uh, measurement, as opposed to around sort of 72% with no simulation um, present. But what was most powerful as I put on there, without wanting to sort of gloat, I mean, they've got hundreds of comments and they're not all positive, um, but the qualitative comments are really uh, interesting and, and helpful. 
Um, you know, um, students mentioned, like I've been talking about, about better application of learning, a uh, chance to work with their colleagues and greater understanding of theory. Um, there are some areas of development, if you like, or negatives, um, where some students don't like group work. Um, you know, the simulation can be quite repetitive, but I think the key thing there is use it as structure, but don't just rely on the simulation to do your teaching. That won't work. You absolutely can use the simulation a lot to begin with and get involved. Um, but then as the weeks go by, I think it's very important to understand that the students will get much, much quicker at doing the decisions, making, making the decisions and the tasks. So you really need to make sure that you just don't go, oh, it's another seminar, we'll just do the simulation. Um, you know, really, really engage with students and they will get uh, the most out of it and also um, will be most satisfied with it. Um, I actually found my um, feedback was 100% whilst delivering online. Uh, this year, I think it was 95%, but a much bigger program and had seminar leaders, although they were excellent. Um, but it could well be the fact that they probably prefer the uh, the virtual me rather than the uh, the, the, the real me. It's quite, it's quite possible. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, and I think the link to NSS as well, we find is pretty strong. That final year um, is really, really important. So I'm not going to go through all the, the sort of points, but you can see that you know, students on the whole uh, have been really, really happy, um, I think, with the simulation. And I think the attendance is possibly the, the best um, uh, proof uh, of that. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. What, far away then, Leon, if you've got any questions yeah, no, that no, come absolutely. through the chat. Um, sure. No, and thank, thanks, Peter. That was really insightful and really interesting. And um, I mean, just on that slide as well, I know it's always nice, of course, to see the really good stats, you know, 95% this or that. And that's, that's really positive. But, but it's when you see these comments as well that it really hits home, doesn't it, as well, how uh, valued this is. Um, and, and that linking to NSS as well because I'm not sure if we said actually from the outset that this is a, yeah, this is a, a level six uh, module. So it's, it's third year. So it's the final year of undergraduate study. So that link to the, uh, the national student survey, which we have in, in the UK here, and obviously other countries have similar surveys, that's going to have a really immediate link then, isn't it? And, that, and it's nice to see that you're, you're seeing that. So that's great. Okay. Well, yeah. So some of the questions, I'm um, sorry, go on. No, no, go on. I'm ready. We're all ready okay. to, uh, to answer. Perfect. All right. Well, what I'll do is I'll just I'll just take them in order rather than, um, yeah, trying to sort of pick and choose individually. So, uh, Dr. Mohammed, uh, can you elaborate how it will be linking theory to practice? Um, OK, I'll give, give you a, a sort of an, an example. So, um, you, you know, I, I will try and take a theme that we probably covered in the lectures each week. So, you know, one might be on the let's take the ICs on the micro um, so macro environment. And, um, you know, you're bringing something like pastel. You know, I would use that in the seminar as something, an activity that they would um, do alongside the, the simulation. And then they can try and apply it, um, it, you know, as a team, as a group and, and work their way through. The same with, say, um, Porter's Five Forces. Um, they can actually think about those forces in relation to um, the simulation. And then, of course, when it comes to the assignment, instead of them, you know, just introducing a theory and discussing it and maybe hopefully critiquing it um, and perhaps giving a few examples, they will hopefully be able to really think about, well, what does that mean for them? You know, what are the five forces to my sneakers company? And they can even use the name of the company itself. Um, and uh, so I think that's where I found that I was able to bridge all of the, the models and the concepts and all of those abstract points and go, but what does that actually mean to you? What, your business, if you're trying to make money, you know, what, what is the relevance uh, of that? So uh, does that kind of answer your question? Well, um, I hope so. Uh, but yeah, feel free to, to say in the, uh, in the chat, of course. Um, yeah, I think uh, uh, Dr. Pamela is saying, yeah, thanks for considering my question. So that's fine. Yeah. We have another, another question as well. Um, or, or perhaps just to expand, actually, a little bit from my perspective on that, Peter, is just to sort of say that, you know, the, the simulations, we see them as really being um, sort of separate from the theory in a sense. So it's like, yeah. you know, the lecturer is still responsible for delivering and disseminating that theory piece, but the simulation is where that's applied. And I think that's that's perhaps important to, to consider. Although there is one exception for that. One of our simulations, my marketing experience, sort of tries to bring both together there a little bit. Um, Okay, another question is uh, from Natasha. Is uh, so Natasha is moving to a block teaching format um, in the undergraduate strategy class. 
So are there any specific adjustments that you think would be necessary to make uh, to make the simulation work in that format? You'll have to forgive me. What um, uh, block teaching? What, what do we mean by that? Is it, so, we... Yeah, well, please, please feel free to say, Natasha, if you like. But my understanding of block teaching is so doing short modules one at a time rather than multiple modules long across the semester at, alongside each other. So you do it much, much more quickly. Um, is that is that the, the thinking? So you you compress I, it into a few weeks, or yeah, and um, I think I think yeah. So I think that would perhaps be the main the main difference, wouldn't it? So everything else would would work the same, but you would just condense it and do multiple rounds, sort of over much. Uh, yeah, and it's you, saying that's correct. You would. I, mean, I think she might also be asking. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Natasha, but um, maybe it, it might be multiple teachers. So you might maybe you, you're thinking you might have a module leader or a seminar leader for two weeks or three weeks, and then you have a different seminar leader. Um, I'm not sure that might be the case. And I think actually that could still work um, fine. Um, I think it would probably be uh, less preferable, but I think it, it would still be fine because I think the students will be familiar after a few weeks as to what they need to do. And like I said, the, the lecturer doesn't have to be super proficient. Uh, they should have some understanding, but it, it's got a fairly user-friendly um, uh, you know, user interface. So um, I, I don't think that would be a big problem, uh, providing they're engaged in it. I mean, one thing I should add, actually, that the, you know, the feedback that we had was very positive, around 90% plus for all those Edumundo modules. Um, I think that was brought down quite heavily by one module, where the module leader was much less keen on the idea. And of course, you know, the students follow the, the, the module leader or the seminar leader. You, know, you need to have enthusiasm about it, and, and they will naturally, too. Um, so I think if you did have different teachers or multiple teachers on the same um, in, in the same seminars, then I, I don't think that'd be a problem. But it is definitely one that you'd want to have a module leader overlooking and training um, accordingly, just to make sure people are up to speed. But that'd be much easier in the second year, third year, etc. Okay, but, but certainly anyway, you know, in terms of uh, working within a much shorter sort of compressed. Uh, time period you know that that's very easy for us to sort of set the simulation up specifically for that time period so really compressing it down perhaps doing multiple rounds within a week of study or doing fewer rounds because that's also uh, flexible in terms of the number of rounds you choose to, to incorporate as well yeah um Vicky has asked uh, about the self-selection of groups via Canvas so how does that work when you have different uh, seminars where students are assigned randomly to them um, you have to have, in my view, I, unless I, there's another way around this, I think you'd have to have students uh, that are working consistently in the same team. Um, I think, I think you, you, you would, you need ownership. Um, you know, a bit like playing for a, a football or a hockey team. You know, you want to be with the same people each week, making this, the decisions based upon what happened last week, what should we do this week, and, and what do we forecast that's going to look like. Um, and uh, I think if you were to change team members that that's not going to work very very well so you would need some way of having consistency um, perhaps they could work on it if they have to do um, a lot of courses might have an extra hour that is around self-study that could be group study if you like so they could do it offline that could work absolutely fine but that does mean they're having to do it without the um, module seminar leader sort of on hand to try and bring in that, that link to theory answer questions etc um, so I think that would be a bit of an issue. OK, I hope that's answered your question, Vicky. Um, just thought I'll just stop stop screen sharing actually now as we're, as we're oh, talking. Oh, of course. Yeah, um, I can do that. Or, no. or perhaps, yeah, perhaps you can. Uh, yeah, that's great. So uh, well, another question as you're doing that from Natasha about uh, using the simulation across multiple sites at the same time. Um, so would you recommend separate ones for separate campuses? So keen to integrate some multinational collaboration on at least parts of the module, if not throughout. I mean, I'm happy to take that question if you prefer, Peter. Although yeah, I mean, that's a sort of market question, isn't it? So yeah, I'll leave that one to you. Yeah, well, we so we do have some uh, inter-school competitions. So we have multiple universities who have signed up to compete against each other as sort of part of a, a wider international collaboration. Uh, so that, that works very successfully, although it does require um, you to sort of know who you who you want to work with from the outset. But if you have multiple campuses all part of the same course, well, that works even easier then as well. So it's just just a matter of us setting it up accordingly. Um, so yeah, so just let us know if you'd like us to uh, give you a bit more advice on that. 
Uh, Afsane has uh, just said, yeah, thank you for this really insightful talk and the presentation. I couldn't agree more with using utilizing different strategies based on the student's need of the context and the learning objectives. So lovely comment. Thank you. Um, and then just some nice point point if you want Leon about um I mean not just about collaboration but of, of different universities but something I might just add an extra little um, bit of you might find it's good practice just to make it a little bit more fun um is have a bit of a monetary award perhaps a voucher for a store or or something for the winner of the groups and you can decide whether that's winner in terms of revenue which I don't recommend a winner in terms of profit or percentage profit or perhaps the winner in terms of points, which come from you hitting your targets in the simulation. I like to do that. Each market, I provide a, a sort of 25 pound voucher for each member of the winning team. Perhaps you can even have a bigger prize for the winning score across the whole cohort. Um, and I think that little monetary incentive just adds a little bit of fun um, to it as well. Um, I, I think that that's, that's a good way of bringing together different markets so that they're all actually competing, not just against themselves, but against other ones, because they can see the scores of the other teams um, in the simulation. Yeah, absolutely. But just add, just having some sort of additional incentive, for sure, that's always nice, isn't it, for the students? And um, do, do we host uh, the a winner's ceremony with you as well at the end? Um, you... Actually, we haven't had a winner's ceremony. I've done one my, uh, myself, I've done them in the past. And I've also, I used to give out sort of laminated um, certificates. And uh, But actually, I'm really pleased. I think Andy Mundo this year have also done, done those. And I kind of go, oh, great. That's, especially as the cohorts get bigger. Um, and having certificates for the students for how they've done. And it, it, you can have first and second place. I also kind of do a bit of a prize for your know, highest profit um, percentage, you know, highest turnover. Um, and things like that and having that recognition is important and I remind the students that you know when they're going into interviews and even things potentially put on the CV they can say they got strategic management award um, then that that really can be very useful to them and 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 really nice thing for them to have so you know try not to give them out like sweets but I, I think uh, you know giving them uh, an achievement uh, recognition uh, through something like a certificate is, is a really nice thing to be able to do. No, absolutely. Yeah. And it's nice that they can also share those on their LinkedIn profiles, too, because, of course, then it's sort of adding to their, uh, their sort of online CV and boosting their potential employability for graduate employment as well, which is nice. So uh, but, well, I think we've got through most of the questions. If there's any more questions, feel free to throw them in the chat, of course. Um, but it's been really nice to sort of yeah, see everyone being being so engaged on the chat, of course. Um, we're sort of drawing up to, to the end of the hour, really. Well, one minute two. So uh, I'm, I'm guessing that it's probably best um, if, we, if we draw things to a close, really. I, I was sort of planning a little bit to show, um, if we had time, a little bit of the simulation, but perhaps, perhaps as we're at the top of the hour, it's best not to. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I get talking. <laughs> no, well, that's no, that's great, right? Because uh, we did we certainly didn't run out of things to say, and it's been really yeah, it's been absolutely really engaging uh, hearing you talk uh, so enthusiastically, Peter, about um, your experiences, and I'm sure it's been really beneficial to uh, to everyone who's been participating. Um, yeah. Well, let's draw to a close. Thank you all for joining. I've just brought up on the slide here as well that if you do have any questions following this, and you'd like to. Uh, get in touch with us. We'd be delighted to hear from you as to what you thought of the session today, uh, if you have any feedback for how it went. Um, and I put my email address there as well. If you'd like to have a one-to-one -one consultation with us on how you can make use of simulations on your program or your module, then let us know and we're happy to have a review of your module spec and talk in detail as well. So thank you. Well, there. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for all the, your kind comments, and uh, I wish you all the very best of luck. If uh, if you go down the simulation route, and uh, you know, if you did want to reach out to me, then uh, I, I wouldn't mind at all answering other questions. Um, just be in touch with Liam, I assume. Okay. Yeah. Sure. And um, can can people reach you on LinkedIn, for example, Peter? If they yeah, like? actually, I am on LinkedIn. So yeah, feel free. I'm I'm not all that active, but I um I will get a notification, and of course, that would be uh, that would be brilliant. Okay. Lovely. All right. Well. Uh, once again, thanks so much, Peter, and uh, thanks everyone for attending, and hopefully see you at the next one. So, webinar's over. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye now.